This episode was suggested by a listener, Penny, on Facebook. If you'd like to suggest a topic or just say hi, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, or on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. How many times have you seen a horror film or TV show that had a creepy doll in it? Lots of times, right? Poltergeist, Annabelle, Dead Silent, the Chucky movies, Saw, The Twilight Zone, The X-Files, Supernatural. These are just a few examples where creepy dolls wreak havoc on human victims. Even in cases where dolls are not the main antagonist, they are often utilized by the horror industry to add tension. Have you ever wondered why we as a population find dolls so creepy? In this episode, we explore the history of this phenomenon, as well as the possible psychological reasons behind it. Dolls are basically models of humans that have been used as toys for children throughout history all over the world. Archaeology indicates that they are the oldest known toys. The earliest examples of toy dolls come from ancient Egypt, where wooden paddle dolls have been found in tombs from around the 21st century BCE. These were made of wood, and usually in the shape of a woman with large hips and emphasized hair. Japanese dolls have been found in archaeological sites that date to around 8000 BCE, but became more prevalent as toys around the 11th century CE. Rag dolls, or dolls created from fabric scraps, have been found in contexts that date back to 300 BCE. Clay dolls with movable limbs and removable clothing, as well as rag dolls, were recovered from Roman children's tombs dating to 200 BCE, and they are documented as playthings around the year 100 CE. Dolls have been found all over the world in archaeological contexts, showing their prevalence throughout human history. Although some materials degrade much faster, such as wood and cloth, evidence of dolls made of these and stronger substances such as alabaster or clay have survived to be found by archaeologists in Anglo-Saxon era England, 12th century Russia, and 13th century Germany. They range from fairly simple in construction to dolls with real hair and real silk clothing made in the popular fashions of the time. Paper dolls two-dimensional dolls made of paper, began to circulate in the mid-18th century in France. They were shaped like humans, and different fashionable clothing could be overlaid on top of them to change their outfits. They became hugely popular in the U.S. in the 1920s and represented only the most fashionable celebrities. Although in the past dolls were not associated with either gender, in the modern era they became predominantly associated with girls, in 1946, Hasbro created action figures, which were marketed towards boys. These mostly represented comic book heroes and film stars. They also often represented what were considered male occupations, such as soldiers. Dolls were usually represented as miniature adults until 1850, when the baby doll was first produced. After this, dolls in the shape of children and babies became far more prevalent as toys for children while adult-like dolls moved into the realm of art and collector's pieces. In 1877, Thomas Edison made some of the first talking dolls using his phonograph machine to replicate the human voice. These dolls played nursery rhymes after being wound up with a crank. The public found something very distressing about the dolls, and although thousands of them were manufactured, very few were sold. 
Mattel created a popular talking doll in 1959 called Chatty Cathy. She was made to look like a five-year-old girl and had a ring protruding from her upper back. When the ring was pulled, one of 11 phrases played from a phonographic record inside the doll. The phrases ranged from I love you to take me with you, which I think is pretty creepy. But the doll sold almost as well as Barbie for the six years that it was on the market. Over the years, dolls became more and more technologically advanced and realistic. For example, eating and urinating dolls, and dolls that could move thanks to simple robotics. As with many of our forms of play, some dolls have now moved into the realm of virtual reality, with fashion doll apps and online doll houses that are similar to video games, with goals and rewards. Technology has also made it possible to create incredibly realistic dolls, such as reborn dolls, which are detailed vinyl replicas of newborn babies. While dolls are most commonly used as toys, throughout their history, they have also been used as ritual items. In this case, ritual item means something that is used in religious or magical practices. The earliest reported ritualistic use of a doll comes from ancient Egypt, when the enemies of Pharaoh Ramses III attempted to use a wax image of him to cause his death. Dolls used in this way are now called puppets, and at the time, they were used in healing practices as well as the placing of curses. The Egyptian paddle dolls I spoke of earlier may also have functioned as fertility symbols. Puppets were also used in ancient Europe for folk magic and witchcraft. In these practices, a puppet represented a specific person for the casting of spells. This type of magic practice is called sympathetic magic or imitative magic in which a doll or poppet is used as a stand-in for a real person. These dolls were made of roots, grain, corn, wax, paper, potatoes, clay, really anything could be used, as long as it was formed into a roughly human shape. And often they were stuffed with herbs. These practices have roots in early Germanic and Scandinavian tribal cultures, but the use of dolls and sympathetic magic is a global phenomenon. Poppets and effigies were used in Africa, such as Congolese and Kese statuettes, which were thought to contain spirits. Akuaba, fertility dolls from Ghana, which were carried by women hoping to conceive. And Bosayo figures in the Vodun traditions of Benin and Togo, which were symbols of protection and empowerment. Dolls are also used in modern voodoo. However, the traditional Haitian voodoo religion does not make much use of dolls, Voodoo dolls are specific to New Orleans voodoo, which comes from the blending of American folk magic brought over with European immigrants and traditional folk spiritualities from a number of West African traditions and beliefs. This was the result of the transatlantic slave trade and was one of the ways the enslaved peoples retained hope and agency over their lives. In fact, the modern popular version of the voodoo doll comes from the pop culture of the first half of the 20th century and was largely part of a wider negative depiction of black and Afro-Caribbean religions practiced in the U.S. But that is a topic for another podcast. The Hopi people of northeastern Arizona in the United States used kachina dolls as representations of the kachina, spirits of deities, nature, animals, and ancestors, they were thought to be messengers of the gods and were studied by children to learn about them. The Inca dressed double-eared corn and other strangely shaped crops as Saramama, the goddess of grain. The earliest Japanese dolls also represented gods and goddesses, and some were made specifically for funerary rites. Other Japanese dolls, such as Daruma dolls, represented the founder of Zen, but were also used as good luck charms. Kokeshi dolls, which are wooden cylinders with large spherical heads, were thought to originate as massage tools and then developed into popular tourist kitsch. Dolls are still used today in rituals of growth, such as the ceremony of La Ultima Muñeca, part of the quinceañera celebration. The young woman at the center of the celebration must give up one of her dolls, showing that she does not need it anymore. 
This is similar to an ancient Greek and Roman practice where newly wedded young women would give up their dolls to specific goddesses. In the recent history of dolls, something about them has made people feel unsettled by them. Pediophobia, or the fear of dolls, was first described in 1952, and the incidence of this fear has grown since that time. This uneasiness has become so pervasive that dolls are now a classic horror trope, used in books, films, and other media to terrify viewers. The possession or haunting of dolls is a particularly prevalent belief, and several dolls have become famous for their reputation as being haunted, cursed, and possessed. Before I tell you about them, however, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. If you're always on the go or trying to escape thoughts of creepy dolls as you draw or do other things, Audible.com can help by providing you with interesting and engaging audiobooks. In fact, there are over 180,000 of them to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com MCP. You can also find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service, and the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. Our other sponsor is Think Geek the premier retailer for the global geek community. Express your love of Star Wars, Dungeons & Dragons, Overwatch, Skyrim, and so much more with clever t-shirts and other unique apparel, home and office decor, electronics, collectibles, and more. Think Geek has great gifts whether you're into science or science fiction, and many of the items on their website you won't find anywhere else. They're having a huge buy one get one 50% off t-shirt sale right now, so follow our link bit.ly slash morbidgeek to search their massive selection of geeky t-shirts. That's bit.ly slash morbidgeek to get your geek on. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not support or sponsor the MCP yourself by way of a donation? It takes a lot of time to research these topics, write a loose script, record and edit the show, all while keeping it free for you, the listener. When you donate, it helps us pay for research materials and keeps the lights on and the show free. If more people donate, we may even be able to eliminate the need for sponsors. That would mean no break in the middle of the show. If you'd like to help us out, head over to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and click the Donate button. You can make a one-time donation or set up a monthly donation if you're feeling extra generous. Just $5 a month helps us out a lot and it probably costs less than a large latte at your favorite coffee shop. It would almost be like buying me a coffee, which I would appreciate because I have a problem. Also, I'd love to do this show for a living, and your donations, especially monthly ones, can help me make that dream a reality. I really, really, really appreciate your support. And now, back to the podcast. Although many people feel that dolls are creepy, extreme cases exist in which someone believes a doll to be possessed by a deceased human spirit or ghost, or that it emanates some type of curse. These possessed dolls have been reported to move on their own, speak, and sometimes even harm humans. Several dolls are thought to be so haunted that they have become famous. The most famous creepy doll is a Raggedy Ann doll by the name of Annabelle. Annabelle has been made more famous lately thanks to a recent horror film about her. But the stories about this doll were famous long before the films. The doll was given to a woman named Donna in the 70s. Donna lived with a roommate named Angie. Both of them were nursing students and both began to notice something strange about Annabelle. She seemed to move from room to room on her own, and she changed body positions as well. 
Soon, Donna and Angie began finding small notes on parchment paper scattered around the house. They read, Help us. When Donna noticed what looked like blood on the doll and got an uneasy feeling from it, she consulted a medium, who told her that the spirit of a young girl named Annabelle Higgins had died nearby. The medium suggested Annabelle just wanted to stay and be loved, so Donna agreed that the spirit could inhabit the doll. That was when things reportedly began to get dark. A friend of Donna's stayed the night and woke to find Annabelle on his chest. He swore the doll attempted to choke him to death. The same friend also reported on a different occasion that Annabelle scratched a demonic symbol into his body. Donna and Angie were disturbed and called a priest, who then contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens were famous in their own right for dealing with many other hauntings and possessions, Ed being a self-proclaimed demonologist, and Lorraine a self-proclaimed clairvoyant and medium. Skeptics believe the Warrens are frauds, but that is a subject for another episode. The Warrens believed Annabelle was possessed by an inhuman demonic being. It had been invited in, and its next step was to possess Donna and Angie's friend. The Warrens performed an exorcism and cleansed the apartment. They then took Annabelle with them when they left. It's said their car almost crashed on their way home as piece after piece of the car stopped functioning. The couple survived, but reported that the doll had a strong and hateful presence and would sometimes levitate or move from room to room in their home. The Warrens then built a special case for the doll and placed her in their occult museum and after dousing it with holy water, they kept it there on display. It's said that anyone who visits the doll and doubts its power will suffer a severe misfortune. Another famous haunted doll is Robert the Doll. This 40-inch or 101.5 centimeter tall doll is dressed in a sailor uniform. Most of the facial features have worn away, but his face used to be painted like a jester. The doll belonged to Robert Eugene Otto, an author and artist who received it from his grandfather and dressed it in his boyhood sailor costume. The story goes that Otto, who liked to be called Jean, named the doll Robert after himself and used to blame all his own mischievous deeds on him. It's said that this is what gave Robert his powers. Robert remained at the Otto's childhood home in Key West, Florida, while he was away at school in New York and then Paris. Otto married in Paris and brought his wife Annette back to the family home. There they lived until Otto died in 1974. Annette died two years later and the house was sold with Robert in it. The new owners noticed odd things about the doll. They reported that Robert moved from room to room on his own and giggling noises were sometimes heard from the room he was in. Footsteps were often heard in the attic of the house as well, and the doll's facial expression is also reported to change. Robert was donated by the owners to the Fort East Martello Museum. It is said that electronics malfunction near his display, but the worst is said to occur when people disrespect the doll. People have blamed car crashes, broken bones, divorces, and other misfortunes on the doll, stating he was punishing them for doubting his powers. People write letters to Robert, apologizing to him for disrespecting him. So many, in fact, that the museum created a website, robertthedoll.com, so that people can just email Robert. Ghost hunters, psychics, and skeptics have all visited the doll to witness the strange happenings attributed to him. The last famous creepy doll I'll talk about was supposedly found in the cellar of an abandoned house in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, Australia, in the 70s. A man named Kerry Wilson found the doll while exploring the house and brought it home with him. It had a grotesque, stylized face, which I would describe as similar to that of Yubaba from Miyazaki's animated film Spirited Away. Walton named the doll Letta Me Out, because according to him, that is what it screams, but he calls it Letta for short. On the night Walton found the doll, he put it in his living room when he got home and went to bed, but he couldn't sleep because his head was full of thoughts of the doll. 
He got up and put the doll in a bag, then placed it under the house and went back to sleep. Later, he tried to sell the doll, but for some reason felt he couldn't part with it. He also noticed that people and dogs seemed to be uncomfortable around the doll, so much that some people are said to have wept or fainted in fear. Dogs apparently bark and snap at it, as if it were threatening them. Walton soon sought the help of a museum in learning more about the doll. They found that the nails used to hold the doll's shoes on were over 200 years old, and the style was Eastern European. The hair of the doll was real human hair, and under the scalp, the likeness of brain folds had been carved. Psychics also examined the doll, and suggested it was haunted by the spirit of the doll maker's six-year-old son, whom the doll was made to look like. They also said if Walton ever parted with it, he would suffer a great misfortune. Neither of these claims can be backed up with hard evidence, however. These dolls, whether they are truly haunted or not, give us the creeps. Even without stories like these, many dolls are thought to be creepy. Something about their vacant, never-ending stares makes us feel like they are watching us. The older and more weathered the doll, the more we feel creeped out. The feeling of being creeped out is actually a combination of feelings, mainly confusion, anxiety, and suspicion and some physical reactions like chills. A lot of study has gone into what causes this type of feeling. One of these was undertaken by Dr. Frank McAndrew, a professor of psychology and his graduate student, Sarah Connick, at Knox College in Illinois. Through extensive research and interviews, they determined that people are most creeped out by ambiguity of intent, meaning the inability to determine whether or not you are in danger. Behaviors that cause the creeped-out feeling are non-normal, non-verbal, social and physical behaviors, and general unpredictability. These include people standing too close, breathing on you, standing extremely still, staring, reacting to situations in a manner that is either exaggerated, aggressive, or very muted. Being creeped out makes humans more vigilant, focusing our attention in order to glean as much information as possible to help us figure out if we should be afraid or not. But when the person or thing does not try to attack us, we are left with this suspicious anxiety, making us label that person or thing as creepy. We are aware of it, thanks to its non-normal behavior, but it hasn't given us cause to be fully afraid just yet. So what is it about dolls that makes them creepy to us? Why do they set off our evolutionary alarm bells? It may be due to the fact that they are made to look human. If a human acted like a doll, sitting as still as stone, staring, non-responsive, smiling mildly, eyes vacant, we would definitely feel creeped out, unsure what was wrong with them, and wondering whether they were a danger to us. We know dolls are not humans, but they look enough like a human that our ancient survival instincts sense something familiar but off, and possibly threatening. Then there's the fact that they are made to look like children, and they do not act the way a child does. A child is not still and silent, but a doll is. Also, after being so well loved by a child, like most things, they become old, weathered, tattered, yet still they resemble children. This juxtaposition of youth and age is confusing, which is one of the emotions that contributes to the creeped out feeling. Why do we sometimes fear that dolls are or will become possessed by supernatural beings? One reason is likely the history dolls have with religion and spirituality. They have been used in rituals as long as they have been in existence. They have represented deities, ancestors, and living people sometimes acting as vessels for these beings. They are in effect empty shells, appearing alive but not. It doesn't feel like a huge leap for ancient peoples to believe that a spirit left adrift without a body might choose the next best thing to a human body, an empty, human-shaped doll. 
There has, of course, been no solid, repeatable proof that this has ever happened, but fear is not often rational, so this ancient paranoia lingers on. John Leonardi, the director of the film Annabelle, put it simply, stating that dolls emulate human figures, but are missing emotion. They are empty shells. They are a natural, psychological, and justifiable vehicle for a demon or ghost to take over. Children, on the other hand, wish their dolls were alive, but this thought causes shivers to go down the spines of most adults. A doll brought to life by possession, magic, or the imagination of a child skips over the traditional method of creating life. The doll is brought to life by the sheer force of the child's imagination, belief, and love. They make them live, giving the child agency over life. Of course, giving the doll life eventually means taking it away, which is a dark power for a child to possess. This unnerves adults further. Children also occasionally make their dolls do and say things they know they themselves would not be permitted to say. We as a culture ask children to repress so much in order to adhere to our constructed social norms that the thought of all these emotions spilling out, albeit from a doll, is terrifying. In addition, for adults, knowing what's alive and what's not is imperative for a feeling of safety and security. These ideas of reality are challenged by inanimate objects seeming animate, even through the imagination of children. That makes adults uneasy, despite knowing that the doll is not actually alive. Adults that treat dolls as if they were alive also unnerve most people, because that behavior is not considered normal. Therefore, those people get placed in the creepy category along with their dolls. I can't mention a fear of human-like dolls without discussing the uncanny valley. This is the theory hypothesized by a Japanese roboticist named Masahiro Moris in 1970 that dolls, robots, or human animated characters are a pleasant experience until they reach a certain level of realism where they suddenly become terror-inducing. If they are made ultra-realistic, they become pleasant again, even intriguing. In that valley of terror, however, the small differences between human and inhuman, such as the inability to match eye expressions with mouth expressions, become amplified to the point of discomfort. Some believe this valley is quickly shrinking, as humans are exposed to more and more human-like figures thanks to our constant exposure to 3D animation and video games. But we haven't quite filled in that valley yet, although we are coming closer. Despite all the stigma surrounding dolls, they are still one of the most popular toys and collector's items, and still sold and made all over the world. In fact, sometimes their creepiness adds to their appeal. Several companies have created intentionally creepy dolls, such as living dead dolls and monster babies. eBay is also full of haunted dolls that sell incredibly well especially if they are said to have active but not harmful spirits possessing them. This is because people like to be creeped out, some more than others. The same mechanism that gives us that creepy feeling also keeps us interested, fascinated, and curious. We are drawn to it. We want to know what's going to happen next. That is why creepy dolls bring out our curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show, at Morbid Podcast, or find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to Owen, Angelia, Jessica, Michael, Mintu, and Julian for getting in touch via our website. Thank you to Jacob, Jex, Casey, Kelly, Jason, Elena, and James for your comments on Facebook. Thank you to Holland and Neville for your comments and shares on YouTube. 
Thanks to Christina and Lau for their suggestions and corrections on Twitter. The correction was for the Bimini episode, where I said Zhang He instead of Zhang He. Thank you to Olive Moon Studio, T072115, and Catnip17 for your wonderful reviews on iTunes. I read all of these, and they often make my day. A huge thank you to Kevin Zerb for reviewing the MCP on his podcast, Please Stand By, episode 66. You seriously had me blushing. Thanks to you, the listeners. Our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes, and share your creepy stories and cute pet pictures. Also, the MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. As I said before, if you like the show, why not support the MCP with a donation? Your gifts go to the research materials and other things we use to create this podcast. It's also a great way to show your love for the show. If you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and click the donate button. Thank you to the few of you who have already donated. You know who you are. On our website, you'll also find links to all our social media, our sponsors, and other ways to contact us. We really appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening. I'm drinking coffee right now. I do have a problem.